Good afternoon, everyone. Happy Easter. He is risen. Amen. Praise God. Let's stand and worship God together. And let's start by reading Psalm 8. Let's just read the whole psalm today. Uh, Read with me. Lord, our Lord, how magnificent is your name throughout the earth. You covered the heavens with your majesty. From the mouths of infants and nursing babies, you have established a stronghold on account of your adversaries in order to silence the enemy and the avenger. When I observe your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you set in place, what is a human being that you remember him, a son of man that you look after him? You made him a little less than God and crowned him with glory and honor. You made him ruler over the works of your hands. You put everything under his feet, all the sheep and oxen, as well as the animals in the wild, the birds of the sky and the fish of the sea that pass through the currents of the seas. Lord, our Lord, How magnificent is your name throughout the earth. Let's worship God together. the God who is. We worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors. He parted the raging sea. My God, he holds a victory. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be
today we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Why is that important? Do we, do we know? It's because Jesus paid for our sins on that cross so that we could spend eternity with him. I am so grateful for his sacrifice. You guys sing with me. I hear the Savior say, thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine all in all. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as
washed it white as snow. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as Do you feel the world is broken? Do you feel the shadows deepen? Do you know that all the dark will stop the light from getting through?
one thing I was thinking is that we just celebrated Good Friday. If that was the Friday the, the disciples celebrated, it wouldn't have been a good one. They'd have been sad, scared, everything. Now we can reflect how good it was because if he hadn't went to the cross, we would have never had Jesus come back from the dead so he could save us. Lord, uh, you know, it's just an interesting point. During World War II, when we won the victory, we were really ready to celebrate. I can't imagine a victory better than what he did for us. When I came to the Lord, it was a way to celebrate forever. I hope in each of your hearts that that's exactly where you're at. To celebrate today as the day you came to know, the, to know the Lord and have him put all the stuff behind you and only get to look forward to what he has for you, to be with him forever. If you'll only accept him as Lord and Savior. Let's pray. Lord, I just thank you so much that what you've done for us, how you love us, how you care for us, how you gave us mercy and your love. Lord, without that, there's nothing. i just so unhappy to see those who don't know you as Lord and Savior that, that if they stay that way, that they will be without you forever. And that's a terrible place to be. Thank you that we can now come before you and worship you in song, and in, the, in your word, Lord, be with Brace, Jason in a very special way as he brings the word today. We just thank you for everything you've done for us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you. Well, happy Easter. It's great to see everybody that's here today. And today is an extra special day to be on time because we just had hail. So... Thankfully, church had already started. Well done. Um, but welcome to GC2. For those of you that are new or visiting today, GC2, our hope and our desire is that we can fulfill the great commandment in the spirit of the great commission by, um, to glorify God by loving him, by loving others, and making disciples both locally and globally. And as you guys know, over the last couple of months, we've been collecting donations for the big Easter outreach that was to happen yesterday when we were going to partner with um, Pastor Silas, not only to reach the Burmese community, but the whole immigrant community in that area. And you know what? It didn't go as we planned. We weren't able to have this big outdoor outreach, but we were able to spend months praying for these people, praying for what would happen, collecting things. And Pastor Silas um, was able to receive all those things. Jason and Gary went down there yesterday to drop off the bags that one of our home groups put together, uh, raffle prizes, all the things that were collected. So he's now, over the week, as the weather kind of lets up, he's going to go door to door. And I just think it's beautiful that we can do that. Nothing is lost. Nothing is mistaken or, or, or wrong or off, and God just has a different plan. So let's keep praying all this week for God to just meet Pastor Silas and the others who are with him as they meet others and to guide his path. So thanks for all that you donated, and I know that it's still going to be a blessing. Yesterday, we had another pivot as well. We were going to have our women's flower bar at someone's back in someone's backyard, but we got to pivot and have it here at church, and it was fantastic. Here's some photos from the event. We had women teaching and encouraging and lots of laughter and joy as we learned to put flowers together, and we just got to linger in the beauty of the Lord and linger in his creation as women, and I'm just thankful. I'm thankful for the women of this church. I'm thankful that we could still meet, so... A lot of you were there, um, and it was wonderful. We have a reminder coming up, well, in a while, but mark your calendars because 
it's good to plan ahead. Um, in October, we have our men's retreat, October 4th to the 6th um, in Pine Valley. If you want to know more, you can talk to John, um, Jason, any of these men that are helping to lead and to plan and learn more. But I really encourage you, if it's a step of faith, if it's a financial thing, that's not going to be stopping you. We can help you with that. But um, I just encourage you to sign up, mark your calendars, and go, because it will be fantastic. Um, and this is the last Sunday that we are, as a church, praying for the Chow family. But let's continue to pray. I know I was so encouraged when he came and shared the testimony of what God is doing in our own backyard and how their family is in ministry together, um, just sharing about the Lord in all the everyday places that they go. And so let's keep praying that God would open up those doors and um, that we could follow in that same, that same path that they are. That, those are things that we can do in the places that we go to. So we'll keep praying for them. And now, um, kids and youth, you guys are dismissed for um, your special Easter time. And um, as they're walking out, go ahead. As they're walking out, I just want to remind everyone that after service, in the um, kitchen, you can actually, if it's raining, you can walk straight through this door. We're going to have snacks and refreshments, hot tea, decaf coffee, hot chocolate. So I just invite you to stay and linger in fellowship and just celebrate Easter together as a church family. And now go ahead and say hi to someone around you. Welcome. If it's your first time, I'm so thrilled you're here. I'm Jason, the pastor at GC2, and especially 
if you're tuning in online for the first time. Uh, we're glad you're here. And yes, I was watching everyone worship and the hail started coming down. And it was like, where are we? So you made it in time. Um, well, we have been in a series uh, since August in Mark's gospel, uh, going through the book. And the last seven weeks, we have been going through the last seven days of Jesus's life. And so today, we come to the end of this 25-week journey, uh, ending at the, op- uh, at the empty tomb. And so we're going to see what the Lord has for us. But would you stand with me as we sing a very old hymn? Uh, This is from Philippians. This is one of the earliest songs in the early church. And it's a hymn that maybe some of you know. Uh, It goes like this. Sing along with me. He is Lord. He is Lord. He has risen from the dead and He is Lord. Every knee shall bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Lord, we come before you as a people confessing this great reality of our faith. Thank you, Lord, for the people you've brought here in person and online. Thank you for the churches working together for the Good Friday service, partnering here in Poway and beyond. Lord, give us ears to hear what the Spirit of God would have for each one of us and that you would impart a word of application and truth to our hearts. Give us ears to hear and the people of God said, Amen. You can have a seat and have your Bible or phone open to Mark's gospel. If you're like me, you have been very amazed at the fast developing world of artificial intelligence. There's an article I found on bulletin.com and it said the future of AI and it talked about how AI will change the world. And it went on to say the innovations that are uh, happening, they're going to shape the future of, huma- of humanity across all sectors. So like education, uh, um, media, customer service, uh, 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 healthcare, manufacturing. I mean, the truth is, like it or not, AI isn't going anywhere. And the more I've been listening to this over the last months from podcasts and experts and articles, you know, on one hand, it seems there are many positive benefits, but on the other hand, there are many concerning aspects. Uh, Take, for example, this article, Ghost Bots. Is resurrection of the dead through AI healthy or haunting? Anyone, raise your hand, anyone here of Ghost Bots? They also go by uh, death bots, grief bots, uh, AI ghosts, or AI afterlife. Is this new for everyone here? Um, This church is not in the distant future like years away. Uh, There are people and organizations already in China leveraging, uh, or I should say in Asia, leveraging this technology. For example, uh, this YouTube video, it did say uh, the rise of China's ghost bots. And here is this, you can watch it a few minutes uh, at home. This father turned to AI to digitally revive his son, gathering videos and pictures and audio, things we all have, and recreated his son so he could still interact with him as if he were alive. Another example, this famous Taiwanese entertainer used AI to bring back his deceased daughter who died from a very rare uh, disease, and he recreated these kind of real conversations and interactions with her. Uh, You can see her singing and dancing. I mean, it is kind of frightening. You see, already in places of the world, language of resurrection is now common, and it has nothing to do with Christianity, (laughs) Take, for example, this article, the South China Morning Post. Uh, It said, death is not the end of a loved one, so a grieving family could pay $1,400 to resurrect a dead one with AI. 
It is not an understatement to say that AI is changing the future of humanity, but really, what really struck me is the father in that first video said this, I quote, when technology truly develops, the concept of losing a loved one may not exist because people will be eternal. What do all these AI developments reveal, church? I think it's this, that deep down within the human soul, we desperately yearn for the Easter message to be true. See, regardless of your background, your belief, maybe even your dislike of Christianity, the despair of the grave, it is a universal fact. And all these AI uh, snapshots, they're really just a glimpse into affirming what scripture says about the human condition that God has put eternity in the heart of every person, Ecclesiastes 3. We come to this message today, the empty tomb, hope for uh, restoration, and we're reading the historical account from Mark, and we will discover two themes in this short account, and it's these themes. Resurrection not only overcomes death, and it is infinitely more glorious than what AI will ever offer. Yet the second reality that we're going to unpack is that uh, the resurrection, it is an invert invitation to pursue restoration and wholeness along the pathway of discipleship. You can follow along with your outline there. You see three kind of sections we're going through. Now, the way Mark frames the Easter drama is we got to back up a little bit to the tail end of Good Friday. So let's Pick up with the women. After Jesus was crucified and let out his last breath, the curtain in the sanctuary, it split in two, and the Roman centurion uh, witnessed it and said, this man really was the son of God. And then we meet the women at the cross there, verse 40, were also women looking on from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, the younger and of Joseph and Salome. When he was in Galilee, they would follow him and help him. Many other women had come up with him to Jerusalem. Now, this is the first time in Mark's gospel that he discloses within the Jesus movement their female followers. Now, unlike the male uh, followers, the male disciples, I mean, they've vanished and then they fled, <laughs> they're gone. So it's the women that are present. And so we see here, though, they're at a distance. Now, what is Mark trying to communicate with this? It Actually, it links to another figure who was looking at a distance. Do you remember when Jesus was taken away by the high priest and the leaders and the elders? Mark 14, we see Peter followed him, notice, at a distance, right in the high priest's courtyard. He was sitting with the temple police, warning himself by the fire. So off in the distance, what is Mark communicating with that? He's showing us that uh, Peter was disguising and covering up his identity as a follower, as a disciple. And now Mark wants the reader to think, will these women do the same? Are they gonna pull a Peter? <laughs> you see, now is the time of testing. Will they remain faithful to the end or will they fall away like the 12? And if you've been with us through Mark, we've seen Mark has kept all the women anonymous. And so this is a remarkable shift because now Mark names them. They're validating the witness account of the empty tomb. And we'll see the significance of that at the end. Now in typical Mark style, he pauses the scene with the women and he inserts this other character to make a contrast when it was already evening because it was preparation day, that is the day before the Sabbath. So we have late afternoon before sunset. The burial requires quickness, uh, the next day's Sabbath. So they have to do something right now. So who steps into the drama? We have this very unlikely but courageous figure and he takes center stage between the death and the resurrection, Joseph of Arimathea, verse 43, a prominent member of the Sanhedrin who was himself looking forward to the kingdom of God, came and boldly went into Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. Now, where was Joseph during the trial? 
Well, very likely he was right there, kind of maybe front row seats, watching the accusations and the indictment of Jesus, yet he kept silent. But now we see the tides changed with Joseph. What is he doing? He's, he's showing sympathy, right? He's showing sympathy to someone that was just charged with sedition. So this is risky business, right? His own group just indicted this treasonable, this Galilean prophet. And so he is putting his entire life and reputation on the line. And we see his courage, it is sharply contrasted with the cowardliness, right, of the disciples. It appears that perhaps he is this secret follower, this secret disciple. Now, only Mark is the only writer who tells us that he had to muster up this courage to be an advocate for Jesus's body. And what is Pilate doing now? We see Pilate was surprised that he was already dead. Summoning the centurion, he asked him whether he had already died. When he found out from the centurion, he gave the corpse to Joseph. So he's surprised he died quickly, so he needs to verify the account with Joseph. Verse 46, after he bought some fine linen, he took him down and wrapped him in the linen. Then he placed him in a tomb cut out of the rock and rolled a stone against the entrance to the tomb. So what is Joseph, what is he doing? He's, he's acting like he's a family member of Jesus. He's, he's doing what one of the official, though courageless disciples, should have been doing. And so this courageous follower, he's acting like one of the 12. And if we just kind of pause here, I think this kind of reminds us, church, we should be careful when we see someone's life and kind of quickly write them off and think, oh, they'd never be an advocate for Jesus or they'd never stand up for Jesus. I mean, this reminds us, church, that we should not judge someone because we don't know what God has been doing on the inside. Now, back to the women, we see Mark's going to complete the scene, although now it's not at the cross, we pick up with the women at the tomb, verse 47, now Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, were watching where he was placed. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James, and Salome brought spices so they could go and anoint him. Now, remember, during Sabbath, they couldn't travel or purchase these spices, so now they're just kind of springing into action. Now, the purpose of anointing uh, it was to prevent the decaying corpse. It wasn't to mummify the corpse like the ancient Egyptians did. In this anointing, it was an expression of devotion. Uh, verse two, very early in the morning, on the first day of the week, they went to the tomb at sunrise. They were saying to one another, <clears throat> who will roll away the stone from the entrance to the tomb for us? Uh, only Mark uh, records this little mini conversation along the way. And I kind of think it's a little humorous. I mean, here the women, they're, they focused on all the minor preparations, but they forgot about like the one major obstacle, like the stone. <laughs> and so it's like, you know, unfortunately, all the men are gone. So hopefully they're going to find someone along the way to help them. Looking up, they observed, verse 4, that the stone, which is very large, had been rolled away. When they entered the tomb, they... They saw a young man dressed in a long white robe sitting on the right side. They were amazed and alarmed. And so naturally, this unexpected presence there, it just evokes this great distress and alarm and astonishment and, and fear. And so first, the messenger, this angelic messenger, very human-like, addresses their fear. And then, don't be alarmed, he told them. And then he addresses their hope. You are looking... For Jesus the Nazarene who was crucified, he has been resurrected. He is not here. See the place where they put him. Now notice it says he has been resurrected. That is in the, the passive action. So he didn't raise on his own. Listen, he was resurrected by and through and from the power of the living God. Amen? 
His body was certified dead from a Roman executioner. I mean, his corpse was laying cold in the tomb until God's explosive sovereign power raised him up and his cerebral cortex was firing back up again, right? His muscle fibers were twitching. There was blood again flowing in his veins. His lungs were freely moving. The same fingerprints that carried the cross are now carrying his grave clothes. You see, resurrection, church, it not only overcomes death, it not only revokes death, but it's overriding the grave as this place of despair. And this is what I shared AI is trying to offer, a way to cope with this universal and this existential reality about the sorrow and sadness from the grave. And so Jesus walking out of the tomb, he's declaring victory over the sorrow of the grave. And for those here today who trust in him and his finished work, your future is safe and secure from the despair of the grave, amen? Now, if that's not like, Great news, we've got more good news. Uh, this resurrection we see, it is an invitation, this pathway to pursue restoration along the journey of following Jesus. That is just called discipleship, following Jesus. Listen to the rest of the announcement. The messenger says, verse seven, but go, tell his disciples, uh, circle this, highlight this, and Peter. He's going ahead of you to Galilee. You will see him there just as he told you. Did you ever notice those two words, and Peter? I've thought a lot about this this last week. Why does the messenger single out Peter? I mean, why not, if you're gonna single out anyone, say, Go and tell the disciples and Pontius Pilate and Herod and the others who played a part in the indictment and let them know, hey, you're on the losing team. <laughs> that would have been more fitting or why not some words of appreciation? Go and tell the disciples and Joseph of Arimathea. I mean, let him know he's gonna be blessed exponentially for how he treated Jesus's body. That makes a lot of sense. But the disciples and Peter, why why single him out? Let, let's refresh our memories a bit about uh, Peter's uh, history. Well, Peter, going back, Peter was in the courtyard. One of the high priest's servants came. This is before Jesus went to the cross. Uh, while she saw Peter warning, warming himself, she looked at him and said, you also were with the Nazarene Jesus, but he first time denied it. I don't know or understand what you're talking about. Then he went out to the entrance and a rooster crowed. When the servant saw him again, she began to tell him, uh, tell those standing nearby, this man is one of them. <laughs> but again, he, number two, denied it. After a little while, those standing there said to Peter again, you certainly are one of them since you're also a Galilean. Then he started to curse and to swear with an oath. I don't know this man you're talking about. Number three, immediately a rooster crowed a second time and Peter remembered when Jesus had spoken the word to him before the rooster crows uh, twice, you will deny me three times. When he thought about it, he began to weep. When it mattered most for Peter, he totally blew it. In his tragic three-part denial, I mean, it is just heartbreaking. And let's be honest, we can relate to this. Of course, our situation is very different, but nevertheless, we can have actions and thoughts, right, that distance ourselves from Jesus. Maybe we're silent when someone says, are you a Christian, right? Or we hire a Bible on our office desk, right? We're ashamed at times to identify with Jesus. And like Peter, what happens is we begin to feel sorrow and sadness and regret and shame when we look back on that moment. So what do we need? We need what Peter needed, restoration. And for Peter, apparently, he's not included with the disciples. You see that? There's this wide fracture between Peter and Jesus and Peter and the others. And so just... 
uh, read this with your biblical imagination here. I mean, imagine the, the disciples, right? Hearing uh, the message. I mean, imagine, you know, and Peter's off to the side. I mean, what's Peter thinking? <laughs> if Jesus is alive, whew, he's coming for judgment and he's gonna let me have it. Uh, you guys go ahead. I'm, I'm no longer a disciple anymore. I mean, after all I've done, I should be getting what I deserve. I'm walking away. These two words, church, do you hear the immeasurable, unwavering, unending grace that is dripping off these two words and Peter? You see, before pitiful Peter even repents and admits wrong, there is an invitation to restoration that is extended to him. You see that? And this isn't the way that we work in our relationships. We say when someone's wronged us, well, if you repent and feel really bad about it <laughs> and remorseful, you know, maybe then perhaps I, you know, may show love again and forgive you and we can consider perhaps restoration. But that's not how Jesus worked. Jesus says, I love you and forgive you before you repent. That's what draws you into my presence to be restored. That's the way of Jesus. You see, church, Peter, he left in disgrace and he turned his back on Jesus, but paradoxically, we see that his disgrace is what qualified him to come again to Jesus. And go to Galilee, what's the big deal with Galilee? Why go to Galilee? Well, if you've been with us through this journey, Chapter one, Galilee is where it all began. The place of calling, the place of commission, the place of faith. Back to Galilee means going back to the promising call where Jesus said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And for Peter, this remaking, this refashioning, this molding for Peter after his massive failure, he needs a massive touch of grace from the master. But you see, this time in Galilee, what will be different is they will have new insight into the resurrected Lord. Not just crucified, but now the resurrected, exalted Lord. And then the journey will come full circle. Yes, remarkably, shockingly, undeservingly, Peter is invited as well <laughs> to be restored to Christ and to be restored to his community. You see, resurrection church, it is an awakening to this new beginning. Yes, the new beginning for all of creation, right? All of creation now waits for the final restoration when Christ comes back, but also resurrection is a new beginning that is deeply personal and profound. Why? Because we see here the power of the risen Christ. It is extended as an invitation to step into this ongoing journey of restoration, regardless of what you've done or what you're doing or what you have thought about doing. Now, maybe you're wondering, well, what about the women? <laughs> what happened to them? Let's finish verse eight. They went out and started running from the tomb because Trembling and astonishment overwhelmed them, and they said nothing to anyone since they were afraid. So they bolt from the tomb. However, they're uh, scared out of their minds, and they actually, it seems, ignore the angel's commands. They say nothing to no one. Now, we know eventually that they did say something, right? How do we know? Well, the Jesus movement got started. <laughs> what Mark is trying to say is they didn't do it immediately, and so we see here for Mark, the story of Jesus at the empty tomb. I mean, this is it, it ends. This is sudden and abrupt. There's an incomplete ending. Now, now maybe you're wondering, Jason, in my Bible, it says I got verses nine to 20. Now, there's lots of debate on this. This is the long ending of Mark. I don't wanna get into it, but you can see in your footnote, uh, that section is not in the earliest and best manuscripts. So we can conclude that this is the ending of Mark, but it still feels very unfinished, right? I mean, what's up with this sudden ending? It's like Mark kind of leaves the reader hanging. Well, I think what he's trying to say is kind of like the 12 disciples, even for the women, to some degree, they left the task unfinished. And so there's kind of this open invitation, we should say, this open challenge for the reader, for the listener, you and me, who will continue the task? Who remains? 
to what degree will you let the Easter message change you? and fulfill your responsibility to step into and join in completing the story. Now, as we come to the end, I think there's maybe two kinds of listeners. I just wanna offer an application. Perhaps you're in one of these two situations. Maybe the first group, you do have some doubts. You've heard this before, this uh, historical account, but you still have some doubts and you're saying, you know, I want this to be true, but I've got questions like, are the gospels reliable? Well, I commend you for uh, searching out these things. Take one of these little books on the way out and it will answer perhaps some of your questions for you. Uh, but I will just say this, if, if, uh, if the resurrection is not true, uh, Christianity falls like a stack of cards. Uh, don't take my word for it. The Apostle Paul said it himself, if Christ hasn't been raised, your faith is useless. Eugene Peterson in the Message Bible, he says, everything is smoke and mirrors. I like that, right? Everything hinges on the resurrection, so just dismantle it and Christianity implodes from the inside out. So I encourage you, investigate the evidence. Uh, this book, again, is a journalistic investigation of the evidence of the resurrection. Uh, but we can just look briefly at one thing we saw today uh, that proves I think there's some historical authenticity to this account. The, the fact is that all the witnesses were women, right? Now, in the ancient world, uh, that would be a terrible and ineffective way to start a religious movement. Uh, the world, one of the world-renowned uh, historians, Richard Bachman, says it this way. Women were thought by educated men to be gullible in religious matters and especially prone to superstitious fantasy and excessive religious practices. So if the apostles were fabricating this lie of the resurrection, I mean, using women, I mean, that's just a terrible idea. That's the worst way to do it. It's impossible, I think, to start a traction, uh, get a traction that way. Uh, through, though, the testimony of the women, we see the message of Jesus, it spread like wildfire and lives were transformed and the apostles were willing to die for it. Now, maybe you're thinking, Jason, uh, wait a minute, many people today are willing to die for a good cause. And uh, that's right, right? Because they think or they believe it's true. So think of terrorists or uh, extremists, right? They're a good example. They're willing to die for something they think is true. But the case is when people discover something that they uh, thought was right and they discover it's false, I mean, who would still die for a cause that they knew was 100% a lie? Not gonna find it. And so the apostles, right, they were eyewitnesses. I mean, they were threatened, they were beaten, they were willing to suffer, and some of them were martyred. Why? Because they were willing to die for a movement that they knew was fake and false? That's really not plausible. You see, they saw with certainty the resurrected Christ. And that's how the Jesus movement started and spread around the Roman world like wildfire in the next three centuries when all the odds were stacked against them. The second application for us here today is what degree will you let the Easter message change you? I think for many of us, we're not maybe doubting that historical evidence. I think our problem maybe is that we doubt it has any relevance for the here and now of life. I found this article from Lifeways. Uh, it says this, the title, Americans believe in Easter resurrection, but aren't sure why it matters. Uh, they researched that two-thirds of Americans uh, believe the gospel account, that it's historically accurate. But they go on to say, despite accepting it, most Americans aren't sure that it matters. And so my question, is that you here today? What's the connection for you? Jesus overcoming death, offering this pathway of restoration, does it matter in your life? What evidence bears the fact that you believe in that, that you see the connection? You see, the good news of the gospel church is it's not just hope 
for the next life, right? Our future glory and joy, right? Peter would write, we have an inheritance that will never fade, spoil, or perish that is kept in heaven for you. But until that day comes, the Lord invites you to lean into this process of restoration. That's the good news. Are you leaning into it? Maybe you're thinking, well, gosh, you don't know my moral failures. Or maybe you've backslidden or you've walked away. Maybe it's an issue of purity or something else inside, right? Greed, selfishness. Maybe it's your own apathy and discipleship for not really caring recently. Or maybe it's a relational conflict that's been happening in your life for months or years, and you can admit that you were not honoring God in that relationship, and as a result, there's bitterness or anger that has begun to shape you. Listen, the crucified, resurrected Jesus would say, your development as a disciple, it is not finished. It's not finished, right? And that is why, church, we can continue on in this journey of discipleship. It's why we can confess and repent because we will be met with the unconditional grace of God, right? The love, the forgiveness of Jesus, the goodness. And church, when we come to that place, we will discover afresh the resurrected power that is working actively in our lives. And that, listen, that is what compels us. That is what enables us and that is what frees us to admit again that we need to be transformed again and again for his glory and our good amen let's pray as we respond in song lord thank you for the wonders of the resurrection the truth that penetrates our hearts and the joy that we receive when we think about eternity, and I'm thankful for that, Lord. But until that day, Lord, work in our hearts, Lord. Teach us that we never move on from the gospel, we only move on in the gospel, that how it all started by faith, through grace, Lord, that we would walk in the grace that you offer. Take a minute before we get up, just say, Lord, there's this one area this one area that I need restoration. Take a minute, make a simple prayer to the Lord and name that, rest, that area that you need restoration just right there in your mind and heart. Just bring it before the Lord. Say, Lord, I, I need you in this area to restore, to bring wholeness and healing. Let's not get up so quickly, but let the Spirit work. The resurrected, exalted Lord is here. Take a minute, church. Thank you, Lord, that this process that you've laid out for us of discipleship, it is all a walk of grace where we meet your forgiveness and love along the way, your forgiveness and healing and hope, Lord. Help these people here to experience that in the next days. Amen.
Let's give a clap of praise because Christ is risen and that we can worship together. Well, it's wonderful to see you all here. The rain has, I think, stopped. We've got the refreshments in the back. Please stick around for fellowship. I'm up here. I'd love to pray for you, whatever's going on in your life. Uh, if you'd feel so inclined, stick out your hands to receive the benediction. It's from the Apostle Peter. He says this, praise be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ and into an inheritance that will never fade, spoil, or perish, kept in heaven for you, GC2. And as we go out of these doors, Lord, we want to walk in the victory of resurrection power. Thank you for the joy that awaits us, Lord, but help us to see the joy that awaits us tomorrow, the next day, and this week, and the next month, Lord, as we walk in the fullness of restoration as brothers and sisters on mission here in Poway and beyond, and the people of God said, amen. Amen. Have a great evening and week. Looking forward to fellowshipping Later. Amen. <laughs>